Buenas tardes. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias a todos. Esta es una noche muy especial para todos nosotros porque nos volvemos a ver por primera vez después de, de la pandemia, del aislamiento. Nos volvemos a ver físicamente, nos volvemos a sentar juntos. Nos, no sé si tocar, pero vamos a compartir mesa. Eh, es la primera vez en el país que hacemos esto eh, después de todo lo que hemos pasado. Y un pasado, o sea, lo que hemos pasado ha sido complicado, estábamos hablando ahora con algunos de vosotros, eh, porque de alguna manera ha emborronado el pasado y de alguna manera también ha comprimido el futuro. O sea, no sabemos muy bien si lo que pasó pasó hace seis meses o un año y medio, cuando nos vimos la última vez, y, y, y lo que esperábamos para los próximos diez años lo queremos hacer en tres o lo queremos hacer ya o lo queremos hacer dentro de poco. Y es, esa noche, es esta noche tan especial la que hemos querido compartir con vosotros y con David Chipperfield, que está aquí. Thank you, David. Uh, especially since we spoiled your evening and the football match, <laughs> you're not enjoying or suffering uh, about. <laughs> anyway, uh, muchísimas gracias también a, a, a Sir David por haber aceptado venir a este, a este encuentro, especialmente a venir a España para esto, sin saber que hoy su equipo jugaba un partido... <laughs> Eh, importante, digamos. Hay muchos personajes, muchos artistas, intelectuales eh, que aparecen en el país, que aparecen en Icon, que aparecen en Icon Design, en las revistas, pero pocos de ellos reúnen a la vez, a la vez, el reconocimiento por su trabajo, la admiración por sus valores y la estima por su posición ética ante la vida. Y si me permiten ponerme un poco sentimental también, el cariño personal. Y David Chipperfield es una de las raras personas que reúne todo eso que acabo de citar. Así que le agradecemos doblemente que haya aceptado eh, estar con nosotros en esta primera eh, noche en la que nos reunimos. Y ahora, eh, simplemente me gustaría añadir un, un un tono personal para que vean que todo esto que he dicho no es relaciones públicas preparadas para un discurso. Yo he vivido años en Alemania. La primera vez que llegué a Alemania, he vivido en Berlín, eh, el muro de Berlín todavía existía. Yo llegué a Alemania en el año 89, antes de la caída del muro de Berlín. Y sé lo que era el, el Neues Museum antes de que eh, Sir David lo interviniera. Y creo que Muchas veces admiramos de un arquitecto eh, la, la parte quizá más, más visible, más superficial, más monumental. Y es muy difícil a veces eh, emocionarse con lo que no es evidente a primera vista. Yo creo que cualquiera que haya estado en el Noyes Museum, yo he estado allí. Entonces he, estado, he sentido delante de una pared, de una pared sólida y ver cómo de esa pared sólida emerge como una filigrana en un billete, eh, las heridas de la historia, la fragilidad de la memoria y también los límites eh, del bien y del mal en el ser humano. Y todo eso viendo eh, esa filigrana en una pared y todo eso gracias a la, a la sensibilidad y a la mano de Sir David. Así que, Sir David, thank you very much for being with us tonight. And uh, I think you and, and Danny have the floor. Thank you very much. Bueno, eh, muchas, muchísimas gracias a todos por estar aquí. Javier, muchas gracias por tus palabras. Creo que va a ser difícil que diga algo más ilustrativo sobre el trabajo de David. Eh, la charla va a ser en inglés, eh, espero hacerme entender para todos y sobre todo para David. Um, so, thank you so much, David, for being here. You know that we were so, <laughs> you know that we were so happy with our conversation in Corrubedo uh, that we did for last Icon Design, uh, that it's quite a privilege to have you 
here for a second round. Um, I would like to start quite straight. Um, I would like you to uh, introduce yourself and tell us who you are, what you do. In front of my wife. <laughs> Afraid so. <laughs> I can't be so honest. Um, well, thank you, and thank you for the invitation. And I'm, <coughs> I'm very uh, confused tonight, not only by the football, uh, but <coughs> to be speaking in front of some of the best architects in Spain here. So I feel very inadequate to talk about architecture in front of so many important Spanish architects, but I will try to say something. <coughs> and with Rafael Moneo sitting in the front row, <coughs> I have to say he has been uh, very important to my, you asked me where my career came from, I mean, I would say, I will mention how important he was in this journey. Um, I, was, I was born in, uh, well, I w actually I was born in London, but when, when I was uh, three or four years old, my parents moved to Devon, to a farm, so I grew up on a farm. So. Um, uh, as soon as I was old enough to escape to the city and go to a art school and architecture school, um, I suppose uh, I was fascinated by the, ci by the city and I was fascinated by buildings and architecture. So uh, <coughs> I, it's a sort of strange thing to have this um, uh, strong connection with a, a small community where I was brought up, at, at the same time a great romance about the city. Uh, I studied in uh, Kingston School of Art. When I, when I was young, it was possible to study either in uh, architecture school or in uh, art school. And my academic qualifications were not great. So art school was a possibility, which was actually very, very good. I enjoyed it. Um, and then I went to the AA, and then I worked for Norman Foster, Richard Rogers, and people like that. And then <coughs> in 1985, I began my own office, as all of us do. Um, with a certain innocence and naivety. <coughs> uh, and um, uh, yeah, so become an, an architect on your, on your own, which is, I suppose, what, you, what one wants to do as a young, um, slightly uh, arrogant ar young <laughs> architect. Um, the... the my career has been very strange because it's been mostly outside of my own country. Um, and the reasons for that, I've reflected on a lot. Uh, and actually, it was partly because of the, um, the environment of Britain in the 1980s. Uh, Margaret Thatcher was Prime Minister. It was, she dismantled the public system and began what we now all see as the, the Anglo-Saxon <coughs> uh, uh, method of uh, investment and development. And it wasn't uh, uh, very easy for a young architect. Um, and uh, so, that was, that was the climate within which I started. And in fact, one of my first uh, opportunities was to teach in, in Harvard from the invitation of Rafael Moneo. So as a young architect, it was a fantastic um, uh, encouragement. Uh, and uh, there were many other encouragements along the way. You said uh, in the past that um, it wasn't easy to grow as a young architect in, in the UK, precisely because of the, uh, this sort of um, 
ambience that didn't encourage novelty. Uh, that, a couple of things happened that were uh, sort of funny or ironic, taken into account where you are now. Um, you're, you're prompting me to tell certain <laughs> stories that you know about. <coughs> um, uh, well, look, it's not easy to start to be a young architect anywhere. I don't imagine it was very easy for people like uh, Juan or Alberto or even Raphael. Um, so, and it's a, it's a strange thing because <coughs> you, you have to start everything yourself. You know, you're, you're not, um, you know, our career as architects is a strange one. We have to invent our, our office and we have to develop it. And then, <coughs> then I guess when we've gone, something stays, but it's, it's a, it's a strange, I mean, I, I, I suppose if one's a doctor or another profession or a lawyer, you tend to plug into existing structures much more. But as, mm -hmm. as um, uh, if you run your own office, you're, you're creating uh, your own uh, context as well, your, your own structure. Mm -hmm. And... Um, I would say one of the problems with our profession is that we have to be competitive. You know, we have to, in a way, establish ourselves uh, in, in contrast to others. I think if you're a doctor, you don't really have to say, well, I'm a better doctor than he is. I guess you all, you, you just say, yeah, he's a good doctor. Um, whereas, as an architect, you're somehow yeah, I don't like his work so much, or I don't like her work so much. Or, you know. So it's a strange profession where um, instead of being regarded by some sort of common measure, we're all trying to prove that we're better than the other one. Uh, and I think that that has a negative uh, influence on... But I'm not, I'm not telling the stories <laughs> you want to tell. Um, I think that, uh, so we had a long conversation in, in Galicia, so he knows all, all the stories. <coughs> that, uh, Not all. He's trying to, <laughs> the to get me to say them, but I, <coughs> I suppose that um, uh, there are, if I try to look back on, on my office and how we've worked and how I've worked, uh, there probably is two, two things which are quite formative to it. Uh, one is what I've already said is that I've tended to do 80% of my work in another country, not my own. So I'm, I'm always a visitor. And I think working in other people's places makes you quite, uh, it should make you respectful, you know. If you work in, in Spain as an English architect, it's a sort of arrogance. The, Spain is full of very good architects, so be careful, you know. If you're going to, to work in somebody else's place, it shouldn't just be an opportunistic uh, situation. We're not... Um, salesman of product. So if you work in Zurich, we just finished a museum in Zurich. I mean, <coughs> Zurich is, Switzerland is full of, you know, per square meter, the best architects in the world. So you, you, there's something about working in other countries, let me say it that way, that, that I think puts a double responsibility. I mean, you should have it working in your own town or your own village. I mean, Raphael has worked in Madrid as if with a great sense of responsibility of the city, um, but not all, all architects uh, consider it that way. So I would say, you know, like my first three projects were in Japan, where I had so little knowledge of the culture, I had so little knowledge of the te technical things. So it made me think a lot, what did it mean 
for me to be building in another culture. And I think it's the same if I build in Mexico or Berlin or, or Spain. Um, so I think that that's been an important part of my um, uh, makeup, I would say. Um, I think the other thing was a realization as a, as, and, and maybe this comes back to the, to the English condition, uh, that the, if you, if I was, okay, let me start again. When you go to architecture school, you are trained to expect that the world is waiting for you and that you, when you go out, you will do good things and everybody will be happy that <coughs> you are a good architect. It's really surprising when you arrive and nobody wants you. That the <laughs> society doesn't regard architects and probably doesn't particularly like your architecture. So instead of arriving with some notion of, uh, you know, like a, like a doctor or an engineer or someone valuable, uh, you arrive as, as someone that doesn't have the same value in a profession which has in the past been valued. And in England in the 1980s, you know, it, I don't want to blame everything on Thatcher. I mean, as, a, as an Englishman, it's always very convenient to blame everything on Margaret Thatcher. Now we have Boris, so we can change. <laughs> <coughs> we can blame him for anything else. Um, but there was certainly an erosion of professional respect under Margaret Thatcher. I think that's been very interesting during the pandemic that finally politicians have to listen to experts again. We've seen a, a sort of revival in respect for uh, professional knowledge. But I was surprised how um, being an architect didn't put you in any professional status in England. I think it's, you know, I think it w was very different in Spain. I'm sure, I think the whole world is becoming more Anglo-Saxon. Um, I think it's still quite different in Switzerland, let's say. But in England, it wasn't. So I, I realized <coughs> in that English situation, you had to, uh, you, you had to earn uh, your position. Y you were not given it. You can't say, I'm an architect and I know more than you. I mean, the English do not respect that. I mean, most English clients think they know more than you uh, to begin with, and that they just need you. I'm looking at one client here in the second <laughs> row who was, was not the same. He was, <coughs> he was a very good and uh, respectful, because he came from the art world. So, you know, and, and again, I would say we, maybe the third aspect of my career has been the fortune of working in the, let's say, the cultural sector where discussions and understandings are easier. Um, but it, it wasn't, I mean, this thing that you're telling that uh, you, you have to start like in a humble way, uh, which I suppose that it means that, uh, that you learned to be humble and to talk to clients instead of just like arriving like a star, like you say, or somebody who knows more than the people that they talk to. Was it that widespread in the, in the, in the profession? Because maybe I'm wrong, but I get the feeling that, um, that architecture had a had more straightforward um, ways, perhaps? I'm not sure humble is the right word, but I think, um, well, if we go forward now, I mean, t to where we are now, I, I mean, maybe go backwards. I'm, at this point in my career, I'm more convinced than ever that the profession has to be more collaborative. But I also believe that other disciplines have to be more collaborative too. And I think what we've realized, you know, there's been a very interesting period of architecture. I mean, the last 30 years have been 
uh, I would say, quite, let's say, a, a golden period for architectural production. Um, some amazing buildings, um, and a lot by architects who are in this garden. Um, I think all of us as architects at this point are aware that buildings don't, aren't everything, and that we depend on uh, cities, and we depend on the cumulative uh, things that one building might not necessarily be able to do on its own. And I think the profession has become very aware. All of us individually become aware and anxious that by the time we as architects are asked to do something, many decisions have been made. And many of those decisions might not have been the right ones. So. But why, by the time it gets to us, we can't say, are you sure you want to build a tower there? Yeah, because that's a piece of land I own, and that's what the permission I have, and that's what I'm allowed to do. We know that if we're going to deal with the most existential questions of our time now, which is environment and community, then we need to get further upstream and influence planning decisions, or at least, yeah, stimulate discussions which might have a bigger influence. And unfortunately, and I think Raphael's seen this probably in your lifetime, um, you know, I think in the, uh, in the 60s and 70s, there was much more integration of architects and planning and politicians. And now, I mean, in England, there is no planning profession. There are no planners. They're, they're sort of organizers of, of uh, regulations. But we don't plan anymore because the market doesn't want planning. They just want a sort of a set of rules. So I think this, I, this need for the, our profession to become better integrated and more part of, I mean, in a way, it goes back to my question about why, <coughs> why are we not seen to be more valuable? And is that because of what we've done and the way we behave? Or is it something else? Is, is all these, um, are all these things that you want to solve in part uh, through RIA, the, the association that you've uh, founded in Galicia? I think every, uh, so last year I edited this magazine, Domus, mm. and um, I dedicated my efforts, because it was uh, a lot of work to do this. I mean, I realize how difficult it is to um, <coughs> do these things, but um, I accepted because I thought it was an opportunity to ask the question to the profession. What what is practice now? What is architectural practice now? Not what architectural practice was 10 years ago, what was 30 years ago. And I spoke to many, many architects. And every architect now, and it varies from architect, everybody is genuinely much more concerned about sustainability and environment and community, and the, the value that architecture gives to society. Mm. We can't anymore just say, well, yeah, I, look, I'm not so interested. I'm interested in what I build. I mean, there are a few architects that don't particularly worry about environment or community. They're interested on the object. And by the way, architecture as an independent activity is important. It's not like we all have to become sociologists and environmentalists, and I mean, we're architects, so, you know, architecture is our stuff. But in everybody's studio, we're thinking harder. What can we do? Like in everybody's house, 
we're thinking harder. You know, do we separate our rubbish properly? Are we taking too many flights? Well, not now, but uh, you know, are we are we using too much? I mean, are we, how responsible are we? So we're all trying to be more responsible, and architects in their studios are trying to be more responsible. The problem is, how can we be responsible in our studio? And all the architects I spoke to, uh, so we can, you know, we can question our clients a bit more. We can be more careful about materials in terms of embedded CO2. We can be more careful about uh, thermal performance of buildings, buildings performance, etc. But to be honest, it's quite cosmetic. Of the architects I spoke to who were doing let's say, um, social projects, projects about social housing or communities or doing research work or doing things which were quite uh, engaged in these issues. I would say, that's amazing. So who is your client? And they said, well, actually, we're doing it ourselves. You know, there are no clients who are doing it. There are clients who are becoming more concerned about these issues, but so many of the good initiatives were being motivated, as it were, outside of conventional architectural practice. So it's a little bit of a shame. It's like you, know, you, you have to move outside of normal practice to make more contribution. And to answer your question, yes, in Galicia, because of our strange relationship to this strange place, um, uh, I've also, um, for the last five or six years, been working with the local government and the local administrations on things which, I, which are not strictly uh, to do with architecture, but are to do with the built and natural environment. And, and what things exactly are you... Are you, are you doing there? Um, well, physically, not very much. <laughs> uh, making a lot of noise, probably more than um, results. What, okay, the, 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 the project began, and I can say this because I, I know the architects here. So the project began because um, the president of Galicia, Alberto Fejo, asked me to look at the city of culture, which Raphael knows by Peter Eisenman. And what should he do with this building? <laughs> um, and uh, I told him that I had no idea, but if he could get rid of it, <laughs> that would be the best. Um, maybe give it to another uh, to an, a university or something, because Santiago doesn't need the, the heaviness of this, you know, it doesn't need the building and it doesn't need this um, infrastructure to, to run. Anyway, uh, this wasn't really very useful advice um, <laughs> to him. Uh, but uh, he also then said, but you know, can't you help us with this horrible thing we have in Galicia, the, you know, Galicia failism, the ugliness of our, uh, of our buildings, which is so ugly, it's famous for, you know, I mean, Galicia is <laughs> famous for octopus and for the nature and for ugly buildings. I mean, it's a strange <laughs> uh, reputation, but it's true. And every nice village is, has horrible buildings. There's no planning. So you have a little village and a house in them. And so um, I, I accepted the challenge to say, OK, well, let's, um, let me think about that. His imagination was that I would come back with uh, a guide saying, buildings should be painted uh, you know, this color. The roofs should always be 40 degrees. Uh, the windows should never be bigger than something, something stupid like that. Um, and of course, 
uh, it's, first, it's too late. <laughs> uh, it's done. Uh, and secondly, it's not the problem. And I realized that you, you don't kill a place by bad architecture. I mean, it's, I'm, I have to say that to my architecture friends. Um, but you kill it by roads, by parking, by destroying public space, by building in the wrong parts, by extending the, the, the waterfront of the ports with huge concrete areas which isolate the town from the sea. You destroy it by building lots of small houses in Greenland, while 30% of the town is empty, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we did research and a lot of analysis, and we came back one year later and presented to uh, the president our work. Uh, and we told him the issues are keeping the water clean so that the, the, the community, which depends so much on the fresh water, uh, improving the relationship of the villages to the, to the sea, which was their tradition, stopping the roads, the, the towns being cut by traffic roads, taking parking out of public spaces, making a law that says you cannot leave houses empty for more than five years or 10 years, stopping all building on green land until the buildings in the sound are full, et cetera, et cetera. So he was a little bit shocked that I didn't give him an aesthetic uh, uh, advice, but more one which was, in a way, political. Um, but uh, he listened, and, helped, and so for the last five years, we've been working with all of the ministries slowly on issues of mobility, of parking, of things which we believe have a profound effect on, on protecting the quality of life. I mean, that's what architects are interested in in the end. I mean, we're, we believe that by making buildings, we improve people's quality of life. And that's somehow, and I think the last 12 months, we've all realized that uh, where we live, the park that our children play in, the street that we go, I mean, you know that in Madrid better than anybody, but I think we got a very good lesson in the importance of our environment. But sometimes it was actions that were very simple, and the most difficult thing was the communication part, no? Like the, the explaining the people why this simple action would uh, make the quality of life much, much better, no? I, I'm just re yeah. remembering the part where you, when you talked about the the speed limit, something that simple as a speed limit, that yeah. not everybody was um, in, fav in favor of that, no? No, so one project we are doing is that uh, along the Rio Rosso on the north side, there are five towns, and they used to have a, a central street, which was the social street. And over time, this has become a 70 kilometer an hour road. And it divides every village. So the church is here, the, the port is here, the school is there, the gymnasium is here, da da da. And we have, they, they even have to put concrete barriers. So the heart of the, the town is killed. So it doesn't matter if you paint the houses pink or make nice buildings or make a new. Without this, uh, the, the village is dead. So, and when you drive through these towns, old ladies are trying to cross the street, and they can't. And seriously, there's been a lot of accidents. Um, so we discussed this with the Ministry of Transport. And we said, what you have to do is to reduce the traffic. If you reduce the speed to 30 kilometers, then you can widen the sidewalk, and then you can 
make it so. And it's a very good explanation of the separation of responsibilities. Because the transportation department says, we're not urbanists, we're traffic. So our responsibility is the speed to keep the traffic flowing. Yeah, but the speed is killing the town. <laughs> it's not my problem. I need to keep the traffic going. So finally, we got someone from the ministry to come. And I tried to cross the street with him. So we stood. <coughs> and it takes five minutes because it, you know. And then he said, I can see your problem. No, it's not my problem, it's your problem. <laughs> it demonstrates that if a road that goes through a town is only, is only classified as a road, then you can't solve anything. So you have to, to bring traffic and urban planning and architecture together. Without it, it's impossible. It's pointless. I mean, it's a, so this was a very nice metaphor, in a way, to say to the government, and that's what we're trying to do in Galicia, is to say, you, you, if, you, if you're talking about a circular system, then you have to bring things together. But you also have to bring the community together. And, this, and traffic, I mean, the, the interesting thing is, as we all know, traffic is the most dangerous thing to talk about. So all the mayors in our area say, we really like what you're doing in your foundation. Um, please, you know, help us. But don't talk about traffic, parking, <laughs> or trees. Uh, and we say, but without that, you can't do nothing. It's impossible. That is the problem. And of course, it's the most... The, the, the strangest thing, of course, is that the old ladies, well, I, I, old ladies and old men, who are trying to cross the road, when we publish that the traffic will be reduced to 30 miles an hour, they protest <laughs> because they are also driving. <laughs> so you realize that everybody is two people. You are the person trying to cross the road, and you are really cross with the traffic. But when you're driving, and the, and and I always drive through the village at 30 kilometers to test, and it, it irritates everybody. So we have to meet everybody in the village and explain to them that this initiative is in their favor. And at first, they were really upset. So you think you're doing them a big favor, but of course. But finally, now it's, it's happening. We got, we got the money to do it, and, and it, will, it will happen. But, um, and now all of the other mayors want to continue this process in the other towns. Um, so I think all we are doing is acting like an agency. We're trying to show, because I think architects, architects are trained to be quite linear thinkers. You know, we see the connection between things. And we are the ones that we can see the link between traffic and planning. We can see the, the, the link between empty buildings and bad urban space. We can see those connections. And therefore, I think it's us that need to, to rattle this cage. Because it's not easy for politicians to see that. And so uh, what we've done is to become an agency that connects. So now we, get, now we are like doctors. We do get phone calls from a community saying, we own 180 hectares of eucalyptus forest. Every year it burns down. Uh, we want, can you come and help us think about how we replan this zone? Because we're being involved in things like that. So, I think it's really interesting that there is a missing uh, link, which should be in administration. It should be in public administration. But public administration is organized in a very vertical way. 
as, our, as is our profession. And the, the final anecdote I can say is that when I sit with the Minister of Urbanism in Santiago, and I said, but shouldn't you have a bigger planning department? I said, yes, I would love a bigger planning department. So, but because without planning, you can't coordinate, because you know we are doing planning in 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 Ribeira and they said we are doing the planning, but I don't we can't do it, and they should be doing it, but they don't have the resources. So don't you need more resources? Yes. So why don't we form a relationship with the schools of architecture? Ah, the schools of architecture, they're hopeless. <laughs> they're, they're just, you know, they're training architects. They don't have any interest in anything but building towers in their own. And this is a woman who went to the school of, in La Coruña. She says, I know everybody in La Coruña. They, they sit in their tower and they, they're not interested in the community. We have a project now, four-year project, with the School of Architecture in La Coruña. And when I talk to the architects in La Coruña, they say, yeah, but the politicians, they're stupid. You know, <laughs> they don't do anything. They don't. So you have a profession who would like to do things well. You have politicians who I think can be encouraged. But there is no connection. And I think until we find these uh, connections, Architects are going to be making nice buildings, but at the same time, what happens to our cities? What happens to, to you know, the the bigger idea of environment? There's there's something that um, uh, Galicia we could. Does say anybody know the score? Nil nil. Okay. Actually, I think this is one of our no. <laughs> almost final question. No, no, no. So uh, no, that wasn't it. <laughs> okay. No, we see that he's not listening to me. <laughs> <laughs> so last uh, brainy question. Um, no, you were saying about the things that that you do in Galicia, which we could say that in some aspects is not as developed as other parts of Spain, like tourism and all this sort of thing. So uh, what? can we do in parts that everything has been done? All the not planning has been done, everything has been built, there's not a single um, void square meter. I mean, is there anything to do or, or could Ria do, do something there? Well, I mean, I know in England at the moment, we have a, a huge housing shortage. We have the largest housing shortage since the war. And the government says that the way they will solve the housing shortage is to change the regulations so it's easier for developers to get permission. So it's a, like saying, if you want things to happen, deregulate. I mean, that's why England went out of Brexit, I mean, went out of Europe, because we think that deregulation makes things happen. It doesn't, it just means that that developers can can build more housing, but it's not uh, an engaged idea. So y your question is, you know, what what is there to be done? There's a lot to be done. I mean, we I'm sure there's a housing shortage in 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 Spain as well, or at least there's issues of of uh, you know social infra social hmm. and built infrastructure. But if architects are isolated from this activity, then I think it's a problem. And anyway, but I can't speak about Spain. I can speak about Galicia. And I can only speak about Galicia because I'm using this strange combination of being a foreigner, you know, being, having been there for a long time, and being older <laughs> and experienced and slightly independent. So I'm using my privilege uh, in, a, in a place where maybe I can uh, use it as a tool. But it's much, you know, why am I not doing it in London? Uh, I, I wouldn't be able to do it in London. It's very difficult because it's, it's much more difficult to get 
uh, involved into into the process. So I don't know whether it's possible to do it in Madrid, but I just think that the whole profession, all of us, it doesn't, you know, look, I don't really want to spend the next 10 years narrowing streets in Galicia. Um, it's not really my interest, but um, trying to see whether the built environment and protecting the quality of the environment has an influence on the quality of life, which protects this, I think, extraordinary special part of Spain. I know there are other special parts, but I think it's a special part. And that if that can be a way by which young people want to stay there because they, the quality of life is good, then there's a direct connection between the built environment, the natural environment, the quality of life, the economy, and the community. And that's, that's what we as architects somehow believe in. No, Raphael? I mean, that's, <laughs> that's what <laughs> we've all believed in. So uh, Galicia, the, what we do in Galicia is, is tiny and there's not any great importance, but it's, 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 an, it's an opportunity that I've taken there in this very modest way, but I think it's only an expression uh, of something that the, the whole, our profession is finding at the moment, which is what is our practice now? You know, it's not, no, I don't think it's what it has been for the last 20 or 30 years. I don't think that the next generation should be imitating my generation. David. Thank you so much. I think there's dinner and a match <laughs> waiting for all of us. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here. Gracias a todos.